Omoyele Shoare joins presidential race as he declares his intention to run. And Nigeria's Senate passes a bill empowering lawmakers to summon the, the president to the National Assembly and governors over security. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anako. Human rights activist and former presidential candidate Omoyele Shore has formally declared his intention to run for president. This is the second time the activist will be contesting for the position as he was the candidate of the African Action Congress AAC in the 2019 presidential election. He has promised not to back down on his desire to govern Nigeria. He said the recent petition filed against him by a former member of the House of Representatives, Ned Ngoko, and his subsequent detention was sponsored by the APC-led government to stop his declaration. Mr. Moyele Shawere joins us tonight to discuss his aspiration and plans for leading Nigeria. Thank you so much, Mr. Shawere, for joining us. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, I can. So, yes, just as, right. I, just as I said in the beginning, um, this is not your first rodeo uh, in terms of, no, you know, trying to be president. Um, but this time around, Nigeria, the Nigeria of 2019 is not the Nigeria in 2022. And one would really wonder why you want to take on such an ornous uh, task. Can you hear me? I think we'll okay, take... I've lost. All right, we'll take a quick break and fix uh, the connection. Then we'll start this conversation all over again. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. It's still Plus Politics, and we're being joined by um, uh, Omoyele Shore. Uh, before this break, I was trying to ask him why he wants to be president. But Mr. Shore, thank you so much once again for joining us. So uh, like I said at the beginning, this is not your first rodeo in terms of running for presidency. And you have had a very rocky, t you had a very rocky 2019. Um, what, what would make you still be interested in running for office after all that you've been through? Well, thank you for bringing me on your show. I, I was a candidate in the uh, 2019 election. And um, I guess people needed the experience they had after 2019 to understand how important it is to have competent, passionate, compassionate, and uh, people with a ground understanding of uh, what needed to be done to take Nigeria out of uh, the situation it's been, not only in uh, 2019, but since 1960. So after that period, you could tell that the system came after me because they understood the power of my ideas. They understood how far and wide people were trying to see that Nigeria could actually change, which has always been a narrative that it's impossible to manage Nigeria. It's too complex. You know, people cannot have food, roads, water, and that we can't have a general condition of unity uh, of the oppressed in the country. So after going through that, I decided to offer myself this time again because I've had raw experiences. I've had a raw deal in the hands of system. I understand why that happened was because they knew that I could provide a real alternative that would make them look who you know look exactly who they are, which is incompetent people who just were running a country of two hundred million people uh, as a try and error experiment. So that's why I came this time around. That you know, forget about what I went through. Forget about the fact that they put me in prison uh, for uh, <clears throat> some five months. Forget about the fact that they shot at me uh, in Abuja. Forget about the fact that they ensured that I was restricted to the city and that leadership is about sacrifice. And I remember Kwame Nkrumah becoming the president, the first uh, the civilian president of uh, Ghana, or native Ghana, president of Ghana after he stepped out of prison. 
1957 or thereabout. Interesting. Um, I, I, I want to go into what's happening in Nigeria today. Um, there are lots of problems that Nigeria has now, and that's why I don't know if you heard me the first time before we went on that break. The Nigeria that you wanted to run for president in 2019 is different I, I from you. yes, it's different from the Nigeria of 2022. We have insecurity on every side. I mean, it's no longer a northeast issue. We have insecurity everywhere in Nigeria as we speak. We have ethnic um, divisions. We have non-state actors creep, uh, cropping up, and. It's a totally different ball game. What makes you think that you have the recipe um, to bring Nigeria back on its feet? You know that problems like this, yeah, problems like you've mentioned became so protracted uh, because we had previous leaders who didn't even know how to manage anything in the first place, and it's become even worse because our current crop of uh, rulers. I don't want to call them leaders because they don't have any leadership qualities uh, to uh, qualify them to be called leaders. Can't manage anything. You know, the only thing you hear from them is that Nigeria is complex. You can't manage it. You know, so I understand our specific problems. Our specific problems are insecurity issues, but they just didn't happen by accident. They've, it's as a result of you know, years and years of mismanagement of what should have gone to the people. So many of the kids that you are talking about, they were engaging in banditry or even adults or terrorism. People who have been sidelined and abandoned by society. That people who, when they needed to go to school, you didn't provide them schools. When they needed jobs, you provided them no jobs. And over time, they became tools in the hands of people who, who are also members of the political class. Uh, if we had time, we'll discuss how Boko Haram came about. If we had time, we'll discuss how uh, Niger Delta militancy started. They had all they had political roots. Some of them were armed by politicians who were desperate to win elections. And when they won the elections, they abandoned them. But the guys did not return their weapons. And they became a threat to the state. So you can't just have physical security addressed without discussing social security without addressing the issue of uh, unemployment, without addressing the issue of proper, free, qualitative education. So I discussed this, you know, there are short-term, medium-term, I mean, medium-term and uh, long-term solutions to Nigeria's problem. But the problem with Nigeria, the real problem with Nigeria is Nigeria don't have this. We can address any of these issues. They've never addressed it. They just do try and error. They only know how to do ad hoc solutions to problems. And the rest of the time, they're catering for themselves anyways. They don't send children of uh, the poor to school. They send their children to school abroad when they're sick. As you now know that the president of Nigeria has gone for two weeks again for medical treatment. They don't, they don't, because they, you know, they don't care because they never built hospitals here anyway. They never built roads here anyway. They never did anything for you. And when you ask questions, they send uh, their security agencies, soldiers, secret police, to mow you down as they did with NSAS. What I'm saying is that the problems are not as protracted as they are if they are being handled by people who knew how to even manage a bodega. When I mean bodega, is like a little shop on a corner. So that's, that's what I keep telling people. And that's what I said in 2019. All the ideas that were propounded in, uh, I mean, ideas and theories that were propounded by us in 2019 are still very present today. And nobody has been able to fault them. That's the reason why I came out this time around. Even though, as we speak, I'm still under restriction in Abuja. But that will be broken very soon by situational variables. Let me, let me push you forward on this issue. Because you're, you're, you're saying that the issues that Nigeria is facing um, are solvable. Um, but then there are those who would say that you're not the man for the job because you've never had any political experience in terms of leading in any capacity in the country. And so why do you think that you're the man for the job? Because you talked about trial and error. Is this also an opportunity for you to have a goal, a power? Are you sure that you can handle what's ahead? Yes, because leadership doesn't require you to have the kind of 
uh, experience that our leaders have today. Our leaders don't have any experience. The people who claim to be leaders they don't have any experience that can solve problems. They have experience in office or being in power. And this is where the experience has left Nigeria. Let me give you two clear examples of people who had experience and had ruined Nigeria. Former President Olusha Gombasanjo was a president in his, uh, probably his 30s in 1979, uh, when his, uh, I mean, between 1977 and 79, when his colleague, uh, Murtala Mohamed, was killed in a coup. <clears throat> and when he came back in 1999, you would expect that experience would count for something. And he would have drawn on that experience to run Nigeria perfectly well. What did he do to Nigeria when he was done with eight years? He was seeking a third time in power because his experience wasn't about solving problems. He never had any experience solving problems. He didn't have passion. He didn't have character. And Nigeria was thrown in the toilet. In fact, he selected a successor that was completely incapacitated. And then we came to 2015 when this current president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, who in his 40s was Nigeria's president for a few years. He'd been petroleum minister. He's been everything you can imagine. But today, as former petroleum minister, minister in the 80s, we are dealing with one of the worst, poorest scarcities uh, in Nigeria's history. As we speak, there is no gasoline fuel to drive your cars, to fuel your generators. So why, for instance, why is it that the experience did not help them solve Nigeria's problem? It's because experience in office or having occupied some kind of position cannot be equated with real life experience of solving problems, of confronting problems, of courage, of compassion, of uh, character. And I have more than enough experience because I have been around dealing with this kind of issues, even more complex issues. On what Give level? Me one example. On what level? The, the, because, the, you know, you can actually no, be no, a local government listen. chairman, can but then listen? the, 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 you the know, case of running Nigeria is way bigger. I was about democracy in this country as a young person in my 20s, you know. So I have done, I've managed business before. I've created a company that was a global competing company known as Sahara Reporters. You can put that outside, but that's not enough for me to come before you. What need, what you need is the kind of experience that can deal with complex issues based on exposure, based on education, and based on character and courage. Not the kind of experience they have, which is how to steal, loot, and kill their citizens. So what experience do you need again? It's the experience of a guy who's been consistent and who's uh, been around for 32 years fighting some of the most complex battles on behalf of countrymen and women. And if experience, the type they have is what you want, keep voting for them. And uh, okay. you see where they put you. All right, let's talk about some of the things that you, the plans that you say you have if you were to be elected into uh, government. You said that you would um, create a new constitution for the country. And you also talked about yes. releasing um, Namdi Kanu and Sunday Boho. Uh, but let's start with the constitution part. Why would you want to change the constitution? I mean, there's, there's been a lot of amendments so far. But I'd like to hear why, what your reasons are. Because Nigeria's constitution, as it is presently uh, known, lacks legitimacy. The constitution must be created by uh, a process and it must be endorsed by the people through a referendum. That's how constitutions are created, especially when you're coming from a complex history like we've had in Nigeria military rule, civil war, and all kinds of political crises before then. The 1999 constitution cannot be amended. It's just like saying that you bought the vehicle, you took out the engine, and when they ask you, oh, move, you go and buy new tires. It's not going to take you anywhere, right? 1999 constitution did not go through the process of creating a constitution. And in fact, it was a fraudulent constitution because it says, we, the people of Nigeria, as a preamble. But the people of Nigeria were not part of the creation of the constitution. And you can tell the deficiency of the, 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 the very deficient nature of that constitution today because the agitations that would have been solved if there was a constitution that could have taken care of uh, the, the interests of the people and this diverse nature. So the constitution was not created legitimately and cannot be legitimized by amendments. It is just like what they say in law that you can't build something or nothing. 
So we need a new constitution, just like South Africans did uh, when they ended apartheid uh, in 1994. They went ahead and created a new constitution. First, an interim constitution and a permanent constitution. And it was very, very well uh, done constitution because it took into consideration their experiences, their sorrows, suffering, and their aspiration for the future. This constitution okay. is lacking a vision uh, completely. And everybody's saying it. But I was the first to say it before uh, it became a popular idea that the constitution was a fraud. And it is still a fraudulent constitution. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what is your base? Because everybody wants to know, are you still going to run on the platform of the AAC? Um, what's your political structure across the country? How do you intend to get the ear and the attention of the average Nigerian, being that every Nigerian, whether it be middle class, the low class, the poorest of the poor, they all have different experiences of Nigeria. How do you intend to reach these people? What message are you bringing to them? Again, um, we also have the conversation of zoning. Um, where do you stand on that? So, uh, I'll start with zoning. I'm completely against the idea of zoning offices to uh, politicians. You know, zoning has never helped Nigeria before. Nigeria's political spaces have been zoned to all kinds of jokers, uh, but who don't represent even their zones. Uh, what we want are competent people in the country, and it doesn't matter where they come from, you just have to be a citizen of Nigeria, and you have to have those qualities that I consider to be necessary to govern the country. Because I, in my lifetime, I've experienced the Yoruba president, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if they zoned it to Obasanjo in 1999, who till today, could, when we left office, did not construct a highway to his village. I've had a Niger Delta president who, according to that period, was uh, given that opportunity because they felt the Niger Delta minority, your people, needed the presidency zone. But you make death. it sound, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry to cut in. I'm sorry to cut in. You make it sound like these presidential. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mr. Shore, can you hear me? And they haven't done anything to what you hear me? You're talking about. So zoning is one of the political. Uh, strategies of uh, the lazy political class who have nothing to offer uh, to just reduce uh, the geographical sphere of people who could consider them to be competent and eligible to run the country. But you so make it sound doing, like uh, these presidents are, are were, were presidents or elected to be presidents over their local communities or where they come from or their zones. You said an, a, a former president, Abbasanjo, did not even build a bridge to his village. You're saying the same thing about uh, former president, good luck, Jonathan. Are these supposed to be Nigerian presidents or presidents of their states and their local governments? Is it his job to build a bridge towards his local government? Is that not the responsibility of the states and I, the I federal ministry clearly, of, of what works? I think was, what, 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 what I think you're trying to say is, you know, if this zoning can address the issue of injustice in political distribution of political offices to people, I said I don't believe that you need to zone offices to people uh, who just belong to political parties but don't want to have the required competence and experience. You know, as I have, uh, you know, I'm using the word experience uh, uh, clearly, not the way they are using or the way they've abused it to run a country. Uh, I don't. I don't believe in zoning, and I've said that several because we have zoned, uh, you know, the office of the president and other political offices into, I mean, to different hands, and they have left Nigeria a broken place. So why do you keep uh, using these strategies that are divisive in nature that don't help people realize their aspirations, and the one that cuts out uh, competent people when they need to come on board and uh, step up? To the plates and run the country the way it should be run. I've never advocated for a uh, president of Nigeria based on zoning. You know, it's, it has never worked, and why do we keep trying it? But it is one of the strategies of the political class to uh, just cut out people who are likely to be competent to run the country. Okay. So my other question was what your base is and what party you're still going to... Are you going to still run with the AAC we'll, or are you changing... We'll register, yes, yes. We register, I regi you know, we registered a party in 2018. It's called the African Action Congress. And the party is still one of the active political parties. 
and I'm going to run on the platform of that particular political party. Uh, I know that they are actively, uh, as they did since 2018 or 2019, trying to hijack the party. But we will ensure that uh, the party uh, returns completely to the original legitimate organic members of the party. You have a video of uh, my declaration on Tuesday. And this was uh, after the federal government tried to stop me from declaring by arresting me on a frivolous charge <laughs> uh, a few days before it, with the hope of keeping me in detention and ensuring that I don't declare my intention on that day. But you've seen it. These are young people. So the base is going to be largely made up of young people. The type of young people that propelled uh, Obama to office uh, in the US, you know, and then, but it's not going to be exclusively a young people idea. It's going to include everybody. But the power base, the, the engine that will be running this campaign are those marginalized, oppressed people of Nigeria who are mostly young people. And there are 70 to 75% of uh, the Nigerian population today. Hmm. Let me ask, from the consultations that you've done, from I'm guessing that you're consulting with people and you're having meetings, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, your ambition, uh, what is the feel uh, that you're getting from the people? How um, serious are our youngsters in terms of um, being part of the political process come 2023? Um, knowing that, you know, our young people seem to be um, mostly very active on social media and not as active as we'd want to see them when it comes to the polls. We've also seen a decline in uh, the number or the percentage of people who show up actually on election day uh, to cast their votes. What will you and your party be doing uh, in that regard to get people to be more involved in the electoral process? So let me take you to the current registration process is done by the Independent National Electoral Commission. I know, and I'm sorry, uh, there's a blackout there. And they're saying that over 16 million people have registered online since they recommenced registration of voters. And a sizable number of that are young people. But you know, the idea of, or the issue of young people involvement in political activities recently uh, had more revolutionary, uh, you know, past or history or contemporary history in particular with uh, what happened uh, in 2020 and SARS. It was a political eruption in which young people demonstrated how much interested uh, they are and want to be involved in the political process. And uh, we're seeing that they're registering more, they are asking other people to register. Uh, but most importantly, I'm not just asking people to register and vote, uh, I mean register, but want them to vote and make sure that their votes count. Hmm. And that is why apart from just, you know, declaring to run for office, I'm seriously engaged in political direct action against INEC, for instance. That's the, the Independent National Electoral Commission, who are known to be the ones who bungle the opportunity for people to vote and for their votes to count. And so we've been to the office several times and engaged in protests against them. But we are going to engage in mega protests to make sure that INEC is not just left alone to plan to rig the next election as they've always done against the Nigerian people. So these processes go hand in hand with just the, not just with the declaration to run for office, but to ensure that this declaration produce revolutionary results. That's okay. the result that the people want at the end of the exercise. That is the electoral process. Finally, before I let you go, do you think you stand a chance? I mean, looking around you, um, they're not just old faces, but then there are new faces. We have the likes of um, uh, Chukuka Moye. Uh, there are a few more people who have thrown their, their hats into the ring across political parties. Um, do you stand a chance um, against all of these people? And do you think you're going to win? And what makes you think you do stand a chance if you think that way? You know, you're mentioning some names, uh, some I know, some I don't know. But, you know, I had the chance in uh, 2019, and we know that by way of how I was treated harshly after the elections uh, were concluded. I was uh, arrested because I started speaking on issues that are relevant to the people. And the fact that the elections were badly rigged, 
Uh, this time around, I can almost totally guarantee to you that the chances are better and bright, you know, uh, uh, and brighter and bigger because this time around, uh, the people who have declared interest in the election have never done it in the manner that we did it in Abuja last, I mean, March 1st, which is that we had a hall that was filled up to the brim, you know, uh, populated by young people, and there was an overflow outside of the hall. You have the video with you. This is not Photoshop. It wasn't acted, and most, all the people that came there came, you know, uh, on their own volition, not because they were mobilized. But, the, but does that translate or... to votes at the end of the day? This is my curiosity. And I remember you saying that Tinubu, Obasanjo, uh, Sibanjo, I beg your pardon, that's Mr. Vice President, Peter Obi, uh, that all of them, their presidential ambitions are dead on arrival. I'm wondering why you said that. But have you not noticed that uh, you are not hearing about Peter Obi anymore? And Tinubu is just fading out uh, based on, you know, uh, uh, his own personal health issues and uh, the vice president i don't think i've heard about him recently uh but it is just to tell you that it wasn't a prediction i was just telling you that uh, we are not interested in their candidacy and you know you this speak. how so i was right because you can't tell me anything that's happened after they declared i have not seen peter be or heard about him after that declaration i don't think he even declared i think people were trying to declare on his behalf which was subterfuge the VP, as explained that time, had nothing to show or offer people. How do you say that you are vice president to this failure? And what would you tell people that, oh, my hands were tied, or I was just a coward, and I suddenly just became, uh, you know, very, very courageous now because we are running out of... But they've been, a, they've been in power for eight years with the Buhari regime. And with Bola Tinumbu, man, I just wish people can advise him to check into a hospital. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you. Omoyele Shower uh, is uh, the presidential aspirant for the 2023 election as he throws his hat into the ring. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We wish you all the best. Thank you so much for bringing me on your show. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be looking at the National Assembly as they have... Uh, made moves to enable lawmakers summon the president and governors on a variety of issues including insecurity. Stay with us.